What's up everyone and welcome to Video Game Book Club and it is already the end of the month and that means it is time for our review of Bioshock Infinite. So let's go ahead, take a trip up to Columbia and check this game out. <laughs> I usually hate playing games out of order. Skipping over previous titles to jump into a franchise is just something that has never seemed right to me. All that backstory, all that world building, all of that franchise history that you're missing out on by not playing since the beginning. So color me surprised when in 2013 me and Clay both jumped into Bioshock Infinite for our first time in the series. Neither of us had played the original titles, although as almost everyone knows the original was and still is considered a masterpiece in immersive gameplay. We instead decided to jump straight into the third game of the franchise, and we were so glad that we did. Thankfully, jumping into Infinite isn't like trying to pick up Mass Effect 3 after missing out on the first two. Infinite's story is completely standalone, and until it isn't, but you know, we'll get there eventually. And for us, and for any of you who didn't manage to join in our February title this time around, Infinite doesn't require a deep knowledge of the previous titles, and while you'll probably get more out of some of the story moments if you do know the history, the game will never leave you behind if you just joined the series. In Bioshock Infinite, you'll play as former Pinkerton Booker DeWitt on his quest through the floating city of Columbia to give his mysterious masters the girl so they will wipe away his debt. You'll fight through some fairly varied areas of Columbia all on your quest to find and capture or rescue, however you wish to look at it at the time, Elizabeth. In grand Bioshock fashion, the game sets out to tackle some real world issues. While in the original you fight against an Andrandian level of capitalism that has devolved into drug use and murder, Bioshock Infinite pits you face to face with some other very real world issues such as radical religious fervor, intense nationalism, and an incredibly uncomfortable amount of racism. Bioshock Infinite takes place in 1912 and leans heavily on the racial stereotypes and racist iconography of the time to beat you over the head with how bad the citizens of Columbia are. There are much more thorough looks at the usage of racist iconography and how the game's story and the player's actions interact with the sensitive subjects that the game attempts to use than you'll get here. And if you want to learn more, I'd say go and find those writings because it's just not our forte. While we'll be touching on them lightly when we discuss Infinite's story, let's just say me and Clay are both clearly vehemently against racism and white nationalism. The way things play out and are depicted cause a lot of discussion between the two of us, and the reason I point out to look up other people's writings on the subject is because, frankly, there are just better, louder, and more personally affected members of the gaming community out there who have strong and important things to say about how we can learn from Infinite and what those lessons say about us as a community. Going from last month's wonderful Super Mario RPG to February's Bioshock Infinite can give you a little bit of graphical whiplash. At the time of release, Bioshock Infinite was about as good of a looking game as you could find on consoles, and thankfully, instead of going for a full-blown realism approach, Infinite chose a more stylized approach for their characters, and it has paid off dividends for the longevity of the title. It of course also doesn't hurt that the game was upscaled for current generation of consoles. Daniel played on the Xbox One and that's where his footage is from, because for some reason he's fallen back in love with achievement points and I played on the PlayStation 4 because I don't really care about numbers. And while the everyday citizen and the hundreds of enemies who will find themselves on the wrong end of your guns look the part and won't pull you out of your experience, it's really Elizabeth's character model that was clearly the focus for the team. Elizabeth, who will be your companion for most of your time in the infinite world, has been lovingly crafted to give even the most popular Disney princesses a run for their money. I'm looking at you, Belle. With her exaggerated eyes, her corset-bound figure, her beautiful voice supplied by the incredibly talented Courtney Draper, Elizabeth was the real star of the game for us. Sure, Troy Baker does a wonderful job as the playable character Booker DeWitt, but Courtney Draper's Elizabeth pulls a ton of emotional weight throughout the story, whether it's her first moments outside of her tower, or, well, some darker moments we'll get into later, the combination of her excellent design, wonderful wistful animations, and her powerful voice work, Elizabeth was a point in the game that could have been make or break. 
and believe me, it made the game. I'm sure we'll gush more about Elizabeth later, but there's still other facets of the game's presentation to get to first. Columbia is a world that pulls from our own and turns the saturation up to 100. With picturesque streets and shops, everything is perfect in the early game setting, especially the lighting. This was one of the first games I remember doing natural lighting so incredibly well. There were several times I would find myself pausing to just drink up the view in Infinite. Much like Rapture, but to a slightly lesser extent, Columbia not only becomes a place to move through, but really turns into the third main character of the game. You'll travel through a list of varied enough locations, city streets, slums, factories, almost all with a singular design aesthetic that screams Americana in your face, all while holding your hand and comforting you as long as you fit into a singular monochromatic description. Music melds seamlessly into the world with themes reminiscent of the game's time period, with the inclusion of a few songs that have been rearranged, but we the player know not to be from 1912. This, of course, will later become a plot point, but hearing a 1912 barbershop quartet sing a Beach Boys song, a moving rendition of Creedence Clearwater Revival's Fortunate Son, sung by one of the oppressed as she sits legs hanging over a stockade, and several others, some of which are just used as background music coming out of phonographs like Tainted Love. The most important piece of music in Infinite, though, is one that is actually contemporary to the time period. There's an optional scene around the midway point of Infinite that uses this song again that we'll get to later in the spoiler section. But honestly, over a hundred years after the song was first penned, it's still a gorgeous piece of music. Bioshock Infinite does an amazing job with how it looks and sounds, and thankfully it plays pretty well too. If first person combat isn't your cup of tea, then unfortunately Bioshock as a whole isn't going to be the game for you because gunplay and special abilities, called vigors here, are going to take up the vast majority of your time with brief interludes of exploration attached to fantastic storytelling moments, most of your time playing will be spent going from one firefight to another or looking in every nook and cranny for items and collectibles. Bioshock Infinite limits your weapon equipables to two guns at a time instead of every single gun in the game, but you'll almost never be short of possible choices as all of the enemies will drop their weapons when you kill them in case you're looking for an upgrade. I've always been better with sniper rifles than Daniel, and fortunately for him, Bioshock Infinite has a very generous aim assist, which when coupled with the small fountain of blood that appears when you get a headshot, makes moving forward a satisfying and simple endeavor. Since most fights play out in predetermined arenas, I often found myself hanging back with my sniper rifle, picking off enemies until a melee enemy got close enough. Of course, you have your own melee weapon in the skyhook that you'll, um, borrow from a friendly neighborhood beat cop near the beginning of the game. Not only does this have a melee attack and a pretty gruesome finisher, you can use this to traverse parts of the world by riding skylines. These railings can help move Booker from area to area when the story calls for it, but mostly are used to get around quickly during combat as well as land a devastating skyline attack from above. In my initial playthrough, I remember relying mostly on the carbine rifle, but this time around, I was all hand cannon all the time. Don't have to be good with a sniper rifle if I can just hold a pistol to your head and move on with my day. With over a dozen weapons, Bioshock keeps your favorites coming back while introducing new weapons at a solid pace. The shooting is solid, but does show its age, especially when you're going back and forth between it and this month's hot new battle royale, Apex Legends. Bioshock Infinite might have a better name, but man, those guns in Apex feel so, so good. While you'll shoot with your right hand, your left hand is where your vigors come from. This fun and intuitive control scheme where the two triggers are separate hands allows for a much faster gameplay style if that's what you're looking for. And while you can only have two vigors equipped at a time, once you have discovered a new power, you can change between the ones that are equipped at any time by simply holding the Vigor Select button. 
Being able to change on the fly between vigors like Bucking Bronco that will send your foes flying into the air and Undertow which will then knock them completely off Columbia was satisfying for the entire 12 or so hours the game took to beat. The Big Daddies were a huge part of the marketing material for the original game and their equivalent in this game is kind of split with some mixed results. Marketing wise it would have to be Songbird, a giant winged creature whose job is a mix between protecting Elizabeth and her tower while also making sure she stays imprisoned at the same time. While the Handyman is more the gameplay pseudo equivalent, although they are nowhere near as interesting and you only fight like three in the whole game. Big lumbering robots with men inside, the Handyman can take a beating and keep on ticking, unless you have good aim and focus on the semi exposed heart which is easily visible behind a glass dome. You'll learn a little about the Handyman backstory by finding one of the 80 or so Voxophones, a collectible that you can toggle on to play a recorded diary entry which adds a wealth of information to the world of Columbia and its characters, especially their motivations. My first time through the game I think I missed 3 or 4, this time I got them all and while not hard at all, you'll definitely need to check around every nook and cranny. Along with the box phones, there's the underwhelming telescopes and the very cool kinetoscopes. Kinetoscopes, a real device from the late 1800s, are littered throughout the game and show small movie vignettes that help give a look at a propagandized version of Columbia. Fun fact, it only took about 5 years from the time the kinetoscope was introduced till someone started making porn for it, so going down to your local Nickelodeon and paying a nickel to see your first boobs sounds like a lot better than the scrambled HBO days we lived through. There's upgrades for your guns and vigors, as well as infusions that allow you to choose between upgrading your health, shield, or salts, which is your magic meter. You'll also find equipment that will help tailor your character to the playstyle you want to go with, being able to have large magazines, reload quicker, and shock any enemy who melees me all adds up to a fun time. Of course a fun time is exactly what at least some of the citizens of Columbia are not having. As Booker DeWitt, you'll find yourself in a lighthouse, just like the original Bioshock, but this time, instead of going down into the depths of the ocean, you'll rocket up through the clouds and be met with a beautiful, bright city, floating above the depraved center field world below. After a quick forced baptism, Booker will get his first taste of Columbia, but it won't be long until you get to a scene that has not only stuck with both of us, but caused a visceral reaction of disgust. You'll come upon a raffle where a girl will hand you a baseball with a number on it. The small crowd that is gathered are all entered and hoping to win a first throw at what, you may ask. It's not a dunking booth. It's not a tilted basket to win a stuffed animal. It's a mixed race couple, flanked by racist iconography. If the Prophet Comstock is the soul of Columbia, this is its grotesque, decrepit heart for all to see surrounded by the gleeful citizenry. You're given a choice whether to throw the ball at the couple or to wail it at the gleeful carnival barker who's been egging on the proceeding. There really isn't a choice though. One, because we both immediately chose to throw the ball at the carnival barker because F these people. I'm glad we get to mow them down for most of the game. And two, because none of your choice in Bioshock Infinite actually matter. There's small handful of moments where you're given two choices, but the results are the same no matter what. You don't actually get to throw the ball at the racist piece of crap, instead your wrist is grabbed and you're identified as the false shepherd by the letters AD carved into your hand. You'll eventually find your way to Monument Island, where you'll find and free Elizabeth. Elizabeth is not only your goal, but also a pretty solid companion. In Infinite, much like in the first game, you can't really die. Instead of Vita Chambers acting as checkpoints, Elizabeth will resurrect you. She will also scrounge around for health items and ammo while you fight, and find the occasional coin while you explore the world. Elizabeth has the power to open tears into other universes, which can be helpful in battle by summoning cover, friendly turrets, as well as guns and more health items. These tears aren't only used for battle though, of course. And this is where the spoilers are going to start. Bioshock Infinite story is chock full of twists and turns, and we loved a lot of it especially the parts that focus on the relationships between our main characters. The world of Columbia is really well realized, but we never felt as immersed as we did in the original Bioshock, so it worked out really well for us to play this game first. If you didn't play along with us this month, be warned that we're going to go over some big story moments and spoil some of the major twists and turns the story takes. 
After you save Elizabeth, you'll meet Daisy Fitzroy, a black woman leading the rebellion against Comstock. Daisy seizes your ship, which you need to get Elizabeth out of the city, and says if you bring her gun, she will give it back to you. You'll take Elizabeth to a gunsmith, only to find that he was taken into custody, and once you locate him, you'll find out it's too late. In this universe, at least. Elizabeth opens a tear to a universe that the gunsmith isn't dead. However, he is also dead. At least to the gunsmith, he exists and does not exist at the same time. In this universe, the gunsmith's tools were seized, so you try to reclaim them to solve Schrodinger's gunsmith and get him back to work. You'll also notice that instead of a shrine of Buddha in the gunsmith's home, there's a shrine to Comstock. This will continue to be a theme in the game, a hidden and plain sight example of one of Bioshock Infinite's main themes, constants and variables. When you return to where the gunsmith's body was in the first universe, you'll find his tools and go into a third reality where Fitzroy's Vox Populi are in full revolt and Booker died as a martyr for their cause. In this universe, to protect a child, Elizabeth gets her first taste of death by killing this universe's Daisy Fitzroy. If you were hoping this was going to be a story of two warring factions, one good and one evil, then you'd be wrong. One of my major complaints about Infinite is that, after all the racist iconography and rightful vilification of Comstock and Columbia's population, at the end of the day, the angle we settle on is for both sides to be bad. In fact, both main characters at different times say something along the lines of Comstock and Fitzroy, same person just spelled differently. Oppressor and oppressed. Same thing, just depends on which way the gun is facing back in 2013. Fortunately, the conclusion of the game is when the story is at its strongest. Elizabeth gets taken and Booker will cross a bridge lined with devices that look like giant speakers, which will summon tears. The world that Booker eventually stumbles into is far into the future, where society has completely fallen and resembles more of a fallen rapture. Not in architecture, but in palette and mood. This is where we first start to learn that Infinite is just about opening doors to other universes, but at other times. Booker will eventually meet future Elizabeth, an Elizabeth that wasn't rescued by Booker, was broken down over time by Comstock and burned New York City using the power of Columbia. This older Elizabeth hands Booker a note to give to her past self and returns Booker to a time closer to his own. It's not pinpointed out, but when you do finally rescue Elizabeth, she does mention that it was a long time. There's some reason to believe that it was around six months based on what some of the voxophones you find say. So while this is your Elizabeth, it also is an Elizabeth that has gone through an immense amount of physical and mental pain waiting for Booker to finally save her. Elizabeth vows to kill her father prompting Booker to say that he will do it for her, and in a way, they're both right. Right before you find Comstock, you'll discover that Elizabeth's tower contained a device that dampened her powers. Comstock will demand Elizabeth ask Booker what happened to her finger, which throws Booker into a rage. And Booker smashes Comstock's skull into the birdbath until he dies with many unanswered questions. Booker's nose will begin to bleed and his vision blurs. You'll wind up getting to use Songbird as basically a giant summon in the final battle, and end by having him destroy Elizabeth Tower, therefore unlocking her full power. The device you were controlling Songbird with malfunctions, but before he can attack you, Elizabeth opens another tear to another universe. This time, you don't come out into another Columbia, but instead, under the sea, in Andrew Ryan's Rapture. Unfortunately for Songbird, he finds himself on the wrong side of the pressurized glass, and there's a touching scene where Elizabeth comforts him as the pressure kills him. Elizabeth can now use the full extent of her power. She can not only open tears, but she can create her own. When you leave Rapture, you come to an ocean filled with lighthouses. Not just another door to another world, but a world full of doors to all worlds. There's always a lighthouse, there's always a man, there's always a city. Constants and variables. A man, a lighthouse, a city. Constants. While the false choices we made in the game are just variables. 
they don't affect the true story they're just the small variables within different variations of the same constants as far as excuses for reasons players choices don't matter how shock even it kind of hits that out of the park one of the doors you'll go through in this world goes back to a moment in Booker's life where he refused baptism, but he also didn't. Our Booker did, all of the other Bookers that went to Columbia did, and there are others, more than just the one that died as a martyr for the Vox Populi. Near the beginning of the game, the Ludus twins who figured out how to make a city float and are in fact the very people who sent you on your journey, have you call a coin flip in the air. Each mark on their sandwich board is another you, just waiting for one of you to get it right. And of course there's the bookers who didn't say no. Those bookers turned to faith and became the very prophet that you just murdered. The man who locked Elizabeth up in a tower, tortured her for months and wanted to use her as a weapon is the man that was born when some of your other selves took the plunge into baptism. Not only that, but Elizabeth shows you that the truth is, Elizabeth is actually Booker's daughter Anna, turned over to Ludus to pay off your debts. This is why Booker carved AD into his hand in a kind of penance for selling his own daughter. When Comstock tries to take Anna through a portal to his own world, Booker tries to stop him, which severs her pinky. Booker is gone this entire time not realizing he was trying to save his own daughter that he sold to Comstock. And while one Comstock is dead, there's a million others that aren't. Elizabeth takes you back to Booker's baptism. And instead of the variable of baptism, it becomes the constant of drowning. Elizabeth flanked with alternate versions of herself. Instead of allowing any Comstocks to be born, holds you under the water. One Comstock died drowning in a bird bath. All others never exist by being drowned at his baptism. The copies of Elizabeth disappear and we fade to black. After the credits, there's a short scene of Booker hearing what sounds like a child's mobile and opening the door. The ending is left to the player to determine, did some Booker get to live and still have his daughter? We may never know. It does give me hope for our protagonist that the calendar on Booker's desk shows the same date as it did when he originally sold his daughter, but my calendar next to my desk still says August, so who knows. The whole ending sequence is some of the most riveting storytelling in games. To go from, yeah, I'm gonna kidnap this girl to pay the bills, to, oh, she's my daughter, who I sold to a parallel version of myself, who I just murdered, and now my daughter is drowning me at my baptism in the past before she was born, so all the evil parallel versions of me never even exist, is really well done. And that ending sequence would be so easy to get wrong, but Bioshock Infinite really nails the landing. I wish there was more on the way, but shortly after wrapping up the game's DLC, Ken Levine, the creator of the first Bioshock and Infinite, closed the studio to work on other projects. Another Bioshock would be fantastic, but at least we do have Burial at Sea to look forward to. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, by and by, is a better And that's our feelings on Bioshock Infinite. Let us know below in the comments your opinions on Bioshock Infinite versus 1 and 2, and if you liked the jump from under sea to above the clouds. And until next time, take care everyone. Well, thanks for sticking around until the end of this video. Here's two more videos just in case you enjoyed what you saw on this one, and if you really enjoyed it, feel free to like and subscribe, and also click that little bell icon just so you get updated every time we post a new video. And until next time, take care. Yeah.